By 396 BCE, Vey had long been a thorn in Rome's side. No other city, Etruscan or otherwise, had been to war with Rome as often as Vey. Every Roman king, and most of the subsequent Roman consuls, had at one point or another come into some sort of conflict with the city or its allies. In fact, we are fairly certain that Vey was the first city and people outside of Latium to fight Rome. My point here is that Vey and Rome had been fighting for a long, long time. All that fighting was about to come to a head. Rome had seemingly eclipsed Veientine power, and were now fully committed to ensuring their age-old rival could no longer trouble them. Could Rome succeed in conquering Vey? How would Rome approach the issue, and what would happen if Rome did succeed? Let's talk about it. The final battle with Vey really has its roots centuries earlier. Vey first warred with Rome under Romulus, Rome's first king. This war, a war fought over the city of Fidene, would be a forerunner to no less than 14 future wars. And really, that's just the wars we know about, and the wars important enough to write down. It's very likely that Rome and Vey skirmished with one another every couple of years, and it really makes sense when you look at the locations of the two cities. The cities were only 10 miles, about 15 kilometers, away from each other. That's an easy day's march. But look at this river structure as well. Vey itself was located on the Crimea, a stream in Italy that feeds into the Tiber River. The stream was likely too shallow to really be of much use in transporting trading goods, but Vey was close enough to where the Crimea split off from the Tiber to exert influence over the Tiber River. This was vital to Vey's growth in the 8th and 9th centuries, as it allowed them to not only ship goods to the Mediterranean for trade, but also receive technological innovations from places like Greece and Carthage. I'm sure you can see how this would develop into an issue with the new city of Rome. Furthermore, as Vey gained more and more wealth from its trading expeditions, it began to develop into something of a crossroads for trade, both further into Etruria and into regions like Latium and Umbria. In fact, we're fairly positive that there was basically a road leading out from the city in every single direction. These roads had likely been around for as long as the city had been, and as the wealth and amount of goods flowing through the city increased, so too did the importance and use of these roads. So let's recap just a little bit. Rome and Vey are only about 10 miles from each other. Vey had managed to exert control over the Tiber, and by doing so had turned itself into one of the richest Etruscan cities. And Vey served as a crossroads for trade for basically the entire local region. It should be no surprise then that a city such as Rome was viewed as a pressing threat inside of Vey. By the time Romulus had become king, Rome had begun to exert some level of control over the Tiber, and roads had started to be built in and out of the city. To further compound the issue, the Romans weren't exactly content to simply sit inside their city. No matter how you look at it, Rome and its people weren't exactly peaceful, and Vey was a juicy target for its first route of expansion. It's no surprise then that war between the two cities happened almost as soon as it possibly could have. As soon as Rome rose to a level of power that could actually threaten Veientine power and influence, Vey attacked. However, for centuries neither side could really vanquish the other. While the Romans did seemingly have the upper hand in battle, they could never quite muster enough strength to take the city by force. On the other side, the Veientines could never quite win enough battles to push the Romans back to Rome itself, and thus never really had a chance to take the Eternal City. So for centuries, the two sides basically fought in the fields surrounding Vey and Rome, and each time one side triumphed over the other, the new 100-year truce would be declared. No, seriously, Livy tells us that the two sides often signed peace treaties that created truces which were supposed to last generations, and then they were just as quickly broken. This would all come to a head in 406 BCE. In 406, Rome declared war upon Vey and its allies, namely two other Etruscan cities named Faleri and Campania. At this point in Roman history, Rome was a regional Latin power, and easily the most powerful Latin state. Vey was still an important Etruscan state, but its power had waned in the last couple of centuries. Continuously losing battles in the field to Rome would do that to just about any city. Because of this, Rome had finally, at least on paper, eclipsed the Veientines. However, could Rome actually take Vey? Well, it was a bit of an open question. Vey had invested heavily in their defensive systems over the centuries. Its walls were massive and well-staffed, and the city had built up an impressive storage of food and other important resources. There was a reason, after all, why Rome could never take the city. We are told that the Siege of Vey began in 406 BCE. The siege would supposedly last until 396. I'm not going to cover the intervening years in a whole lot of detail here, mainly for two reasons. Firstly, we would be here for hours as I attempt to sort through the deluge of events that Livy assaults us with. And secondly, most of the events are frankly unimportant. Instead, I'm going to give you a quick rundown, with most of my focus on events that actually have a historical impact, 
and I will leave a link to Livy's writings in the description if you wish to read more in depth. The war started off fairly normal. The Romans marched straight to Vey and laid siege to the city. Siege engines were constructed and Rome prepared to assault the city. However, the city proved to be too well defended for the Romans to make any significant progress. The siege dragged on for a few months until what was supposed to be the end of the campaigning season, sometime around the start of fall. This campaigning season was supposed to mark the end of active battle, so that the Roman military could return to their fields and harvest their crops. Imagine it as a sort of pause in active fighting, but not the war, so that the city's populace and the wealthy men not sent to war wouldn't starve. This is actually a pretty common occurrence in this period of history. It was extremely rare for wars to continue uninterrupted for years at a time. Along with this, it allowed the men in the army to continue to make a living. Imagine what would happen if a well-trained army returned back from a war just to realize that while they were gone, their farms had been seized and they were now broke. Yeah, it wouldn't be a great position to be in for Rome. The Senate, along with the consuls though, did not want to give up so easily. So the Senate came up with a revolutionary idea. Let's just pay the army. Prior to this moment, Romans were expected to serve in the military if called upon, with no reward being given nor offered. Sometimes, if the soldiers were lucky, the consuls for the year would allow them to take a small portion of the plunder gained in whatever war they happened to be fighting in. It should be made clear though, this was not a common occurrence. Most of the time, soldiers were simply expected to serve for free. It was a civic duty, not something a person should be paid for. This changed with this new proposal. We aren't given exact numbers, but this pay was almost certainly very meager. It was probably just enough to have a soldier think, oh, wow, I'm getting paid, but not enough to actually supplement the income a soldier would have made back on his farm. This new pay was seemingly funded in two ways. Firstly, a portion would come directly from the Roman treasury. The treasury was mostly composed of the spoils of war from previous wars. The second was through a new war tax. The tax was deeply unpopular among the more wealthy members of Roman society but the normal populace seemed to love it. However, as more and more senators stepped forward to pay their dues, the rest of the Roman aristocracy and wealthy members of society fell into line, as it would have been pretty embarrassing for them not to be seen as paying their dues. This new payment system would have a massive impact on later Roman history, and really you can make the argument that it was this proposal that began the slow decline of the Roman Republic. The responsibility to ensure soldiers were paid would eventually be transferred to individual commanders and that allowed the loyalty slowly to be transferred to the commanders, the guys who paid the troops, rather than the state itself. But that's a topic for another video. Back to Vey. The rest of the intervening years are spent in a sort of limbo, with neither side being able to gain the upper hand. Rome's siege engines would be destroyed by Vey, yet Vey's army was unable to dislodge the Romans encamped outside the city. Essentially, the war turned into a stalemate. This would all come to a head in 396 BCE. At this point, Rome and its soldiers were beginning to reach their limit. Despite this new system of pay, farms lay in ruin throughout the Roman countryside as no one was able to take care of the buildings nor harvest the crops. And on the front lines, the meager pay wasn't really enough to support the troops nor their families. The army was beginning to grow restless, and the Senate started to worry that if something didn't change soon, then the army might simply refuse to fight. So the Senate decided that a change in leadership was needed. Marcus Furius Camillus was appointed dictator and told to take the city. It all sounds so easy when I say it like that. Marcus Furius, though, was a military genius and a hero of the Republic. He will get his own video one day. And so the Senate and even the army was reinvigorated, and hope quickly spread that Vey would finally be crushed under the Roman boot. Marcus Furius arrived in Vey with new soldiers and supplies in early 396 BCE. He had likely been kept informed of the situation on the ground in the intervening years, and probably didn't need a whole lot of time to be brought up to speed. He knew that a traditional siege was not going to work, and if it could, Rome would have already taken the city. Instead, he needed to think outside the box. The first thing Marcus ordered was that no offensive fighting was to occur without his express permission. The Romans could fight back if they attacked first, but under no circumstances were any Romans to engage first. Next, he ordered a mine to be dug out of view of the Valentine walls. This sounds a bit odd, and I wouldn't blame you for being confused. Why would Marcus waste his time digging a mine? Well, to answer that question, we're going to have to turn to science. I won't go too deep into this, as I'm not a geologist, and I don't want to give you any information that might not be completely correct. But, from what I understand, Vey was built on a plateau of a soft rock known as tufa. Tufa is a limestone rock that's very easy to excavate. Because of this, it was actually a very common building material in Latium and Etruria. Marcus Furius knew that the whole area around Vey was absolutely filled with tufa, so he had a stroke of genius. 
His men couldn't make it over the walls, they were simply too well defended, so why not go under them? Are you starting to see why this mine was so important? He ordered the army to split into six working groups, and the six groups rotated in and out of the mines until the tunnel had been dug out underneath the city. The exit of this tunnel was the Temple of Juno, and as soon as the miners had reached the temple, Marcus Furius ordered his men to prepare for battle. The auspices were taken and found favorable. Before the battle began, Marcus Furius is said to have uttered this prayer, quote, Pythian Apollo, guided and inspired by thee, will I go forth to destroy the city of Vey, and a tenth part of its spoils I devote to thee. Thee too, Queen Juno, who now dwellest in Vey, I beseech that thou would follow us, after our victory, to the city which is ours, and which will soon be thine, where a temple worthy of thy majesty will receive thee. This was likely a good idea considering he was about to dig through the floor of Juno's own temple. Marcus ordered his freshest men to gather in the tunnel, while the rest of the army suddenly charged forward to assault the walls. The Valentines were confused. What could possibly cause the Romans, who had been extremely passive in the past couple of months, to suddenly attack the walls like men possessed? However, they didn't really have much time to ponder this question, as they were forced to defend the walls. This was exactly what Marcus wanted, as suddenly his men in the tunnel burst through the floor of the Temple of Juno and attacked the walls from behind. They were quickly taken, and the gates were thrown open. The Romans flooded into the city. They quickly overwhelmed the Valentines, and the city was officially captured. The survivors of the battle were either killed or taken into slavery, and the entire city was plundered. The Temple of Juno was emptied, and everything in it was carried to Rome, where a new temple would be built in the following years. Livy tells us that the plunder from the city was far more than Rome had spent on the war, and Marcus Furius was celebrated as a hero once again. It's frankly really hard to tell how much of this is true and how much is completely made up. The main issue here is the timeline. While Vey was certainly a well-defended city, the amount of supplies needed to survive a 10-year siege is astronomical. Think about it. Not only does the army need to be fed, an army that is strong enough to hold off the Romans, mind you, but so did the thousands of other inhabitants of the city. If they weren't taken care of, then the Valentines faced a potential revolt. Further, we really can't ignore that the length of this war just so happened to match up perfectly with the length of the Trojan War. No doubt, Livy was inspired by that famous war. Instead, I would personally say that this war either did last for a decade, but with long breaks in between periods of intense fighting, and even possibly multiple sieges, or the war lasted for a much shorter period of time, but Livy wanted to make the war more grand, as it really represented Rome triumphing over an enemy they had fought since basically the start of their history. The next issue is that of the tunnel system. Now, to be fair, this is a little less difficult to believe. Tunnel warfare had already been recorded in Greece by this point, and it wouldn't be all that surprising that Rome may have learned about such a war plan in their trading ventures with Magna Graecia. Instead, what is hard to really believe is how quickly the Romans dug the temple. Digging is hard work, even when digging a soft rock. It's back-breaking labor, and it's not a quick endeavor. I mean, just think about how long it takes construction crews today to dig up a plot of land. Now imagine how long it would take the Romans, who had no machinery, mind you, to dig a tunnel from their camp all the way into Vey itself. Plus, this all had to be done out of sight of the Vantine walls? I'm not saying it would be impossible. I'm just saying that it would almost certainly take more than the few months that Marcus Furius was present at Vey. And we might actually have an answer for this issue. In the 20th century, the ruins of Vey were rediscovered, and archaeological expeditions were carried out. These archaeologists actually discovered a pretty large network of sewage and drainage tunnels underneath the city. Some of these tunnels were still wide open, while others were collapsed or filled with various debris. This right here might be our answer. It's likely that the Romans somehow discovered one of these tunnels and either followed it into the city or were able to excavate it enough to gain entry. This tunnel likely allowed them to ferry a force underneath the walls and carry out the ambush that Livy describes. Or maybe Livy was right and the Romans dug a whole new mine into Vey. But whatever the case, this tunnel was instrumental in ensuring their victory. And with that, Vey had been conquered. The city that had been a thorn in Rome's side since its founding was now finally crushed under the Roman boot. Rome would send thousands of colonists over the next few decades into the city, but it would never quite regain its importance. This was Rome's first building block. They had now established full dominance over their immediate area and had shown the rest of Italy that they were serious contenders for dominance in central Italy. This plan, though, would be knocked back by a few centuries by an event just about five years or so later, the Gallic Sack of Rome. Join me next time as we take a look at what caused Rome to be captured, and the consequences it had on the growing republic. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. Apologies for no video on Monday, I sadly had to mix up with some scripts and it just delayed everything. 
But if you have any comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed. It really helps the channel out. Peace.